Welcome back, Scissors and Scraps. Another summer episode. Mm-hmm. I'm Nicole. I'm Lara. And we have another fun-filled episode yeah. here today on this shitty June night. It's 50 degrees. Yeah, it was 95 yesterday. Yeah. Literally, it was 95 yesterday, mm-hmm. and today it is 52 and rainy. Yeah. We're in sweatpants. Um, so, this week we're going to cover Laura's surgical experience. Yes. Because she's sitting like a cigarette girl with her little um, sling on. It looks like a table. It's a table. We were driving and she's got like all this shit tucked into it like a purse. It was making me laugh. She's like, oh, there's my phone. and <laughs> My wallet. My makeup. Her makeup. Every, like yeah. literally like there's a shit full of stuff in the sling. Um, so we were going to cover that. And then we're going to move on to the Tylenol murders of 1982. Bum, bum, bum. I'm excited. I know the story, but I don't. It, you know what? We'll talk about it more, but yeah. uh, I listened to the podcast on it called The Tylenol Murders by the Chicago Tribune. It was fantastic. Right. It was fantastic. Um, so. Yes. So, Laura, was it two, three years ago, Laura? No, it was December. It, it was, was two Christmas Christmases 2021. ago. Yeah. Laura wipes out on the ice. Yeah. Fucking tears the shit out of her shoulder. Yes. Yes. She waits till summer of 2023 <laughs> to get it fixed. <laughs> It's technically spring. It's still spring. Well, I mean, technically it's spring, but it's actually Dr. Summer off wrote her prescription. Yes, she did. She is off the whole summer. Yes. So. Yes. Let's talk about the day of the surgery. Okay. First of all, I went to like a... Am I saying... Surgery center. Went? Yeah, surgery center. So it's not like at a big hospital. It's like in and out. That place worked... It was like a factory. Like a machine. It was like a machine. It was... Which is I, why I'll never work in one. <laughs> I was I couldn't believe it. I walked in. My mother had to bring me because Mike was still driving Jack out to California. Yes, so, that's right. Mike gets to go to California the week of your surgery. Yes. comes back midnight the night of the day. Yeah. So my mother brings me and I check in and they're like, okay, great. Um, Scan this QR code and then watch the video on your pain pump that you're going to have post-op. And then we'll come over and teach it to you. Um, You know, but do that first. So like, teaching's all virtual now. Okay. No, they have you watch that, but then she comes over and demonstrates Redoes it. Like, okay. it's unbelievable. And I'm like, well, okay. And they're like, all right, um, go sit down, watch that, um, and we'll be over in a few minutes. And meanwhile, this nurse, this peri-op nurse, is teaching, like, other people. Like, I can see her going person to person, like, teaching them what they need to know, like, all. Like, real, n- real nursing. <laughs> like, so, like, organized and just, like, I was like, this place is awesome. Um, so we watched the video. They came over. Then they're like, oh, we're ready for you to go back. I'm like, oh, all right. So I think they taught my mother the rest. Were you the first day case of the no, day? No, I was like, I think I was the second. I go back. I think there was two other people in this entire pre-op area. <laughs> and the nurse is talking. I'm like, it's so quiet. And she's like, I know. Anytime you want to come over here, I'm like, can't do the days. She's like, if you switch and you can do days, come on yeah, over I'd here. I'd rather like, fucking eat diarrhea than oh, yeah, do I was days. Like, no, I can't. But it's so quiet. She's like, it's so nice here. She's like, I worked at a like big. a big hospital and she's like the switch is like it's unreal it's unbelievable I'm like it really is they were it was me like everything was ready like uh, when i sat down on the bed like they already had out like they gave me tylenol and they gave me something like that was already out on my little table like they yes it was so organized, organized. it was but so they organized. are doing the same thing yes. every day like they're not getting an off the elevator weird shit coming right. in no i mean, I mean they they are very they can be organized yeah it was it was I was like highly impressed, and then anesthesia. Oh, I, and as I'm pulling into the parking lot, I get a thing on my phone: sign your anesthesia consent. I just, it, I literally <laughs> pulled it up my phone, virtually signed it. They're like, "Oh, we have all your consent." I'm like, "Okay." I'm like, "Yeah, I signed it." Coming in, she's like, "Yep, nope, I see that. It's all set." I'm like, "Okay, this is the weirdest." Thing. Did anybody go over the anesthesia consent? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they come over and talk to you about it, but it's already like all signed. Um, and then I had to have a block in my arm so they made it like did it take five hours like it does at our place nope okay well a, i don't remember he gave me something <laughs> i don't know i was unconscious <laughs> i wasn't un- but i was like i remember him giving me medazolam i remember a mock in my neck and my shoulder and i remember like sitting there with the drape over but i don't remember anything else like i'm i'm sure i was talking to him the whole time but i don't remember mm-hmm. anything else that time the surgeon comes over, mocks me again. He's like, okay, I'll see you back there. I'm like, okay. They're like, all right, well, we'll be back. I'm like, oh, all right. Like, it was so quick and organized. I go in the room. There was like, I felt like there was like seven people in that room. That's a lot of people, though. And they were like, get out. Okay, move over to the table. And you have to sit in this beach chair table 
Oh, I like I said, Laura, this whole time, if I had just had a picture of you in the beach here, that would have made my day. It's awful. Like you <laughs> your head's like strapped in, you're sitting up. You're sitting up, your legs are in front of you, your head strapped back. It's just weird. But they didn't strap me down. But um they like, okay, move on over. I'm like, okay. And the girl's putting um the mean and die boots on to prevent blood clots. And they only went on my feet. Which they I think didn't is go so on your legs. I was like, I've never I'm seen I'm just gonna those. massage the shit out of your metatarsals. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen those. She's like, yeah, we have these. The other building has the leg ones, but we only have these. I'm like, oh, whatever. But I've just, they're so weird. How big were they? Like that big? They literally just went like, like it little... was like a little blood pressure cuff <laughs> on your foot. It was so weird. I don't know what that's going to do. I'm I, not going to uh, lie. <laughs> and then it's like, okay. And anesthesia was like, oh, do we have an on board for the left arm? Because I was having my right arm done. And they're like, yep, right here. And all of a sudden, I felt this stinging in my arm. I'm like, he's wanting me to sleep. Like, he didn't say, you like, son of a. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say a word. Just do I have an apple? And they like got right here, and I put my arm down, and then the bur- it was started burning immediately. I was like, "Oh my god, he's putting me to sleep!" And I that's it. And I woke up in the recovery room. Well, then she calls me on the way home yeah. with a funny little story that you're gonna share. Yeah. So I wake up in the recovery room. Recovery nurse, super sweet. Like you want ginger ale? And- Here's your tea and toast. Yeah, I had ginger ale and saltine. She was really really nice. You know they. Someone else came out to see me, and then the anesthesiologist who gave me the block and did my anesthesia in the room came out, and he's like, how you feeling? I'm like, great. You did a great job. My arm is completely not. I can't feel a goddamn thing on my whole right side. And he's like, great. He's like, "Um, so you were outed. And I'm like, what? And he's like, you were outed. And I'm like, oh, my God. Did I say something stupid, like on drugs? Like, what did I say? And I'm like, what did I say? I'm a methadone addict. I'm like, what did I say? Did I say something bad? He's like, no. But the staff in the room outed you. And I'm like, um okay what do you mean and he's like um well that you're tiktok famous and i'm like what and he's like scissors and scrubs and i'm like oh my god and i'm like oh uh, y- yeah I and die. He's like, yeah uh-huh so the surgeon is an eight but he stands in the doorway and then does a pull up before he comes into the operating room I'm like one he's a one and i'm sorry and he's like, he would have been a fucking zero I know. My, my book <laughs> And he's like, all right, I said two. I'm like, no, that's a one. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, oh, my God. And the nurse is looking at us like, what are you talking about? He's like, she's she's famous. She does these. I'm like, I'm not. I'm not famous. (laughs) But but I think we are. (laughs) And she's like, oh, she's like, oh, my God. Then when they brought you out here, they said, oh, do you know that she's TikTok famous? But I didn't know what they were talking about. And I'm like, oh, this. And she's like, okay, what is it? I'm like, oh, my God. Hey, any listener wants to come our way from your surgery, I will take it. I know. I'm like, yeah. Uh, That's great. Yeah. And then he called me, like, the next day to see, like, how my pain was or whatever. And he's like, yeah. So I didn't want to say it, but your surgeon was the one that was hanging from the doorway. It was like, he goes. Oh, I believe it 100%. He's like, it was either your case or the case after. He couldn't remember, like, when he did it. He goes, but we had just, like, they had shown me the vid- your videos. Yeah. And he's like, and then all of a sudden, it was perfect timing. All of a sudden, he's standing in the doorway and then reaches up and does a pull up in the doorway. He goes, so I used your humor. <laughs> and I said that in the room. I'm like, oh, good. I'm glad I could give um, you that. Our humor. Yeah, Thank I you know, very much. <laughs> and I was like, oh, good. I'm glad. Glad you got to do that. He's like, I yeah. I can yeah. totally see oh, him God. doing that, too. too. Oh, my God. He's so funny. Full of it. I know. It's like, so oh, so that wasn't a made up. He's like, no, it actually happened. I was like, oh, it's well, I have to time. say, you are breezing through this like a fucking champ. I I really am. They gave me the block, so my arm was numb the whole day, and then the next morning it wore off, and I had a little pain pump that it didn't have, it just has like Novocaine mm-hmm. in it, so it just numbs like superficially, but not like into your joint. You're not going to leave me to go work there, are you? No, I don't want to work there. All right. It was very quiet, though. Um... <laughs> But if like I never had, I never took narcotics. Nothing. I'm, I'm. I feel fine. She just has her little tray in her purse yeah. inside. I mean, it's a pain in the neck. I just can't get over the size of it. Well, it's to keep it. I, know, I have to keep it at a. 90 it's a wedge. She's got a wedge in there. Out in front of me, angle. Yeah, it's a little bizarre. I thought it was gonna be to my body. So I was, was hoping it would be to your body. That yet. was surprising. I don't know what to do with this. I don't either. <laughs> It's very cumbersome. <laughs> I want to accessorize it in some way. <laughs> it's it's off, and then I'm it's like bedazzle it. I think gross because you're eating, and then it's like, I don't know. And you have well, to have I would have my plate on there and just be like, pew, pew. I do, but you have like uh, then I'm like, oh, I'm dropping stuff. I can't take it off. Like I have to wear it all the time. It's gross. gross. I have to dig rice out of it. So. Yeah, I was like, uh, I think I like a belly rice. button. <laughs> I, think I dropped rice. <laughs> He's looking all around. Oh, Mike. <laughs> Well, she was. We were talking about. Um, we're supposed to go on vacation together, and she's trying to back out. And I'm not. I'm gonna not. Let her. 
And she's like, well, you'd have to put my underwear on. I'm like, okay, well, I'm drawing the line at the underwear. You're going to have to like drop it to the ground and pull it up. I will buckle your bra. And I'm not... I said, that's my line. That's well, that's where, what I'm saying. I love you, Laura, but that's my line. I I'm said, not there is such out. a thing as TMI in this relationship, and I don't want to see you naked. Yes, and that's why I said, so we're going to figure You have two weeks. You have two weeks to yeah. figure it out. I All just right. have to. I can't drive up there by myself. If yeah. they let me move my arm, I can do it. All right. You have two weeks to figure it out. My he doesn't schedule. have to do that much. So then the other night, she sends me a picture, and it was after one of our hot days. So I figured one arm had this real, like, funky color to it. And she goes, this is what happens to my arm when it's hanging down my side for 15 minutes. And I'm like, I'm thinking she got a tan on one arm and the other arm is in the sling. And in the meantime, I'm getting things from Mike. This isn't normal. I think she needs to go to the hospital. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I think it's because you've been in a sling. <laughs> All right. But it yeah. was a really fucking weird color. I can only take the sling off to take a shower. So it's like 15 minutes mm-hmm. a day. And it's up like at a 90 degree angle, like in time. front of me the whole all day long. So... When I take a shower, I'm allowed to put it down by my side. So it gets like, it's like if you. It's ruddy. It's like if you forgot hamburg meat in your fridge <laughs> for three months and then pulled it out that purpley, Pinky ready color. color. But I think it's because it's in a sling all the time. I, I really do agree. too. And that's what I said Mike to him. wasn't liking that Mike answer Mike lost though. his mind. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. like that answer. We'll have to put pictures on Instagram. No. I didn't realize Mike was so squeamish. I'm not going to lie. Mike is extremely squeamish. Very squeamish. Extremely squeamish. But we love you, Mike. But he's done. He's done very good. He's done very well. He's he's gonna be a nurse someday. I think I'm a good patient. Right? Dead. You know yep. that dead silence it was that dead ensued. Silence. Dead silence. I think ensued. I'm a pretty good patient. No, no complaints. <laughs> dead silence. He has to help me do everything. But well, Laura, seeing as you would in surgery, you'd probably take Tylenol, right? I have to take Tylenol have to every take day. Tylenol is like the number one pain reliever in the country. Yeah. They had it waiting for me on my little table right. when I went into the A couple of Tylenol. Mm-hmm. Had you taken Tylenol before 1982, mm-hmm. you'd just unscrew fucking cap of Tylenol out of your box that you just popped the lid on. You'd pour a couple of Tylenol. Uh-huh. Now you have a cottoned, sealed, mm-hmm. capped. Child safety. Child safety for a reason. It's all for a reason. Uh-huh. Okay. So we're going to go back to 1982. Chicago, 1982. Okay. Big hair isn't really in yet, but there's big glasses. We got some big oh, glasses big gla- going yeah, on. Yeah, my in mother had huge glasses. We got a lot of dresses. Mm-hmm. Women are still wearing a lot of dresses in 1982. Mm-hmm. Got a lot of feathering of the hair. Yes. Yeah. So 1982 is something. Okay, so we're gonna actually go back to Wednesday, September 29th, 1982. Oh wow. I'm a solid eight, nine years old at this point. Second grade. I do vaguely remember the story hitting the news. Mm-hmm. I couldn't have told you what happened, but I remember hearing about shit on the news because this is i mean my big news story i ever remember in my life was the election of reagan in 1980 that was the first time i remember like hearing anything yes so 1982 i'm getting a little more out of the clouds of being a child and a little more recognition of what's going on okay i was two in 1980 no you were three you were were turning three yes you were turning three so it's september you would have been three that year yes i was still two at the time i've just turned nine yeah because in 1983 it was ten all right so we have um, Adam Janus. Okay. Adam Janus is a Polish immigrant. He's mm-hmm. 27 years old. Mm-hmm. Married. Has a four-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. He's got the day off of work for postal service. He's not really feeling great. So he's going to run some errands. And uh, he stops by. The, he goes, he picks his four-year-old up from school. He runs out and he picks up some steaks for dinner. Nice. It might have been his anniversary or something, but he picked up lilies for his wife. Oh, that was nice. And he picks up a bottle of Tylenol. Mm-hmm. And goes home. So he goes home, tells his wife, I don't feel great. He goes in the bathroom, he comes out, clutching his chest. He's like, I feel awful. Yeah. And he hits the bed. The wife, Teresa, follows him in. She's like, what the fuck's wrong? He's out. Wow. She calls her brother-in-law, who is Adam's brother, mm-hmm. Joe. And he's like, she's like, something's wrong with him. You've got to get over here right now. They call 911. Boom. Everybody comes to the, th- um, the house. At 3.15. Nope. I'm going to go back a little bit. They come to the house. Paramedics are working on him. They bring him to the hospital. At 3.15, he's pronounced dead. Jesus. And they're like, it was a heart attack. You mm. know, there's nothing we can do about it. Unusual that somebody at 27 has a heart attack. But what else would it have been? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was strong like bull. So the family's dumbfounded. But they're all like, you know, they're going to come over to the house. At the Jan- at, at Teresa's house, they're going to plan the funeral for this guy. Yeah. 
Chuck Kramer is a lieutenant on the. It's no, it's like a suburb of Chicago, um, Arlington Heights Fire Department. He's on yeah. the Arlington Heights Fire Department. He's talking to his paramedics who are on this call, and they're like, "Chuck, you're not gonna believe it, right? This guy, 27 years old. We're working on him, right? His eyes are fixed and dilated, but he's still breathing and moving. They're like, it was the weirdest fucking thing we've ever seen. And Chuck's like, huh, that's really, really strange. Mm-hmm. While he's talking to his paramedics, they're, um, they get another call back to the same house. Oh. Right. So back at the house, family's planning the um, Adam's funeral. And he has an older brother, Stanley. Nope. Younger brother, Stanley. Stanley and his wife, Terry, just got married. They don't even have the photos back from the new um, from the honeymoon. Mm-hmm. They just got married. Now, I'm going to... I should have mentioned this at the beginning of this. I got all of this from the Tylenol Murder podcast mm-hmm. um, by the Chicago Tribune. It's excellent. It's a multi... It's like maybe 15 episodes, but very, very good if you get the chance to listen to it. This is almost... I really paraphrase the first episode because mm-hmm. it really gets into the murders on that one. So Stanley comes over. Terry comes over. His sister. There's a whole bunch of people over. Stanley has back problems. He's got a headache, goes into the bathroom, comes out, fucking clutches his chest, drops right there. Oh, my God. The family's like, what the fuck? Terry's hysterical. His wife is hysterical. They call 911. The paramedics are like, same house. Here we go. Chuck's like, I'm coming with you this time. Mm -hmm. He goes in and they're working on Stanley and Terry's grabbing Chuck and she's screaming hysterical about her husband. He's like, all of a sudden she lets go. She fucking <gasps> drops to the ground too. She's got white foam coming on. Like, they're like, what the fuck is going on? Right. This isn't heart attacks. Right. So both Terry and Stan are thrown into um, stretchers, brought to the hospital. Both of them, their eyes are fixed and dilated, still breathing. So all right? weird. Brought to the hospital. When your eyes are fixed and dilated, you're dead. You're dead. Yeah. So to be still moving and breathing, yeah. but your eyes are fixing that is a very bizarre symptom. Right. All right. So Stanley's 25. Terry's 20. Jesus. When this All right. So these aren't heart attacks. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Thomas Kim. He's the chief of critical care at Arlington Heights Hospital with he pronounces Adam dead that morning. Okay. So he's like getting ready to go. He's done. Two ambulances are coming in with the two family members. Mm. He's like, what the fuck is going on? Mm. So he comes in. He's going to treat them as well. Um, And it, he's like, something's going on here. These aren't heart attacks. He quarantines the family members, the paramedics, this Chuck uh, Kramer, the lieutenant. Everybody's quarantined in an office until he can figure out what the fuck's going mm. on with this family. The brother, the older brother, Joe, and the older sister are put in hospital rooms because they're convinced these two are going to drop dead next. Because right. it's got to be a family a familiar thing. So um, Dr. Kim's like, what is the CO2? Is it botulism? He can't figure out what's going on. So Lieutenant Kramer from quarantine, he's like, I can't leave. I got to find out what's going on. He calls Helen Jensen. Helen Jensen is the public health nurse for that area. Mm -hmm. Fucking public. They're bad. Nurse is the badass. That's all I'm going to say. Let's call her up. And like, what's great about the podcast is they're interviewing all these people. And oh, the right. accents are hysterical. Yeah, so Chicago. Helen, yeah. Helen, you know, has been smoking probably a pack of butts a day for years. Mm-hmm. She's like, so I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> I'm cooking dinner. And I'm in my shorts and t-shirt. And I get this call from Chuck. Like, you got to come to the hospital. Find out what's going on. She's like, I drop everything off to the hospital. I go. So Chuck explains the whole situation, all the symptoms of what's going on. And Helen pulls aside the wife of Adam, the, the initial victim. She doesn't speak any English. She's straight from Poland. So they got a translator. They're huddled. And she just explains what happened throughout the day. Helen's like, oh, this is fucking weird. So she goes up to the police. She's like, you got to get me to the house. Mm -hmm. So they drive to the house. She gets in there. She starts looking through the fridge. She starts, can't find anything. She's like, maybe it was botulism. Like, she's trying to figure it out. She goes into the bathroom. She sees the bottle of Tylenol. She sees the receipt for the Tylenol that morning. She counts all the pills and realizes there's six pills missing. She's like, it's going to be the fucking Tylenol. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know what's wrong with the Tylenol, but it's going to be the Tylenol. So she runs back with the bottle of Tylenol and she approaches the medical, the medical examiner's office at this point has gotten involved. So these investigators, Mm -hmm. I was telling Brian about this tonight. I'm like, if I had known these jobs existed, this is what I'd be fucking doing. I'd be in a medical exam. This is just fucking great. So she goes up to him with the bottle and she's like, 
and she's telling the story like you gotta hear she's hysterical with her chicago accent she's like it's it's something with the tylenol and the guy's like it's not the fucking tylenol she's like i literally am stamping my feet and yelling it's the tylenol it's something with the tylenol and he's like it's not the tylenol so she leaves the bottle with him. She goes home. She's like, I poured myself a, sc- a cup of scotch and I cried. <laughs> and I yelled to my husband because they're not listening to me. Nobody was going to believe me because I'm a woman and I'm a nurse. They're mm-hmm. not going to listen. She's fucking right. It's right. something with the Tylenol. So um, finally, Dr. Kim realizes like, okay, there's something going on with these people, but it's not like a contagious thing. He lets the paramedics in the um police go he keeps the jensen's i mean the other family members overnight and he took blood samples from the victims Mm -hmm. all three victims all right um while kramer is going home calls over the radio and they give you like i don't know if he was reenacting the call like you've got to hear the accents i fucking love the chicago accents he's like you know truck 32 calling off going back to the station for decontam when he calls that over, his friend, Phil Campitelli, Phil Campitelli calls, like, he's a lieutenant of the fire department as well. Like, I just love these people, all right? <laughs> he calls Chuck. He's like, what do you got going on? Which is exactly what I would do if you called and you were like, you know, something, I'd be yeah. like, oh, what's going on? Right. So Phil Campitelli calls and Chuck tells him everything happens. Helen thinks it's connected with the Tylenol. He goes, fucking Tylenol? He's like, yeah, the Tylenol. I'm sure he didn't say fucking Tylenol, right. but I said fucking Tylenol. So he goes, it's interesting. My mother-in-law works with a woman whose daughter died this morning, Mary Kellerman. Mm-hmm. We're going to read about Mary Kellerman real quick. Okay. She's 12. Oh, Jesus. All right. Yeah. Mary Kellerman, she's born in 1970. She's a seventh grader at Adams Junior High in Schwamberg. And she's living in, it's a northwest suburb of Chicago. Um... She was a babysitter. Everybody loved her. She's having a headache. She doesn't feel good that morning. So she goes into the bathroom. She takes the Tylenol. Fucking dead within minutes Jesus of this Christ. Tylenol. Um, her father hears her fall. She's dead before the paramedics could get her to the hospital. Oh, my God. And she's buried in St. Michael's um, Cemetery. So he's like, her daughter is dead from the Tylenol. Mm-hmm. So they go back. They're like, it's something with the Tylenol. He t- calls the hospital, tells the nurse about there's another victim and it's connected to Tylenol. So um, two more victims are coming in that same morning. They're all named Mary, which I think is very so bizarre. Uh, we have Mary McFarlane. She's born in 1951 from Elmhurst to Illinois. She's working at her job at the Illinois Bell in Lombard. She has a headache coming on. So she goes and she takes some Tylenol in the office and they interview her co-worker was like, she was the nicest lady. She had a headache. She comes back into the office, fucking drops, starts foaming at the mouth, God. drops dead right there in front of everybody. And they were all like, this woman, this has been 40 years since these murders happened. She's still yeah. traumatized when she's talking about it. Uh, she was a single mother of two young boys. Her sons, Ryan and Bradley McFarlane, are grown. They survived by her, her parents, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Then there's Mary Reiner. She's born in 1955. Mary had just gotten out of the hospital after having her fourth child. She's in a little pain postpartum. Mm -hmm. Takes a couple of Tylenol. Fucking drops dead. Jesus Christ. All right. She leaves her four sons behind um, and is dead. It's terrible. It's terrible. And this all happens at the same time. It's all on the same day. Same day. All All on the same day. Yep. They're all dropping on the same same day. By the end of the night, Dr. Kim is like, okay, what's going on here? Um, and he's like, this isn't acetaminophen poison. Right. Acetaminophen poisoning is a longer death. You're going to shut your liver down. Mm-hmm. It, it's acute. It's going to happen over three or four days, but you're not going to take 500 Tylenol and drop dead in front of somebody's face. Right. Um, so he's, he, all night long, he's like looking at texts. He's pacing. He's trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. And he figures it has to be something that's already contaminated in the Tylenol. It's not the Tylenol that's killing people. Mm-hmm. It's, there's something wrong with the Tylenol. It's contaminated with something. Takes his blood samples that he took from the victims and he brings them to a lab to be tested overnight. An investigator from the medical examiner's office, he also hears about the link, probably from fucking Helen Jensen, right. who's having scotch Who now and getting shit faced and c- crying. C- and in. Right. Um, he hears about the Tylenol link as well and he calls his boss, Dr. Edmund Donahue. He's the deputy chief medical examiner for Cook County. I want his title like that. 
I think it's not so you fancy. Want to do that. Like Cook County's medical examining. <laughs> I'm the chief deputy nurse at such and such hospital, in Boston, Massachusetts. That's a lot um, of responsibility. So he's like, he's talking to the medical examiner, and the the guy's giving him all the details. He's like, "There's only two types of poison that can kill you that quick." Mm-hmm. He's like, "One of them is potassium cyanide. That's going to kill you pretty fucking quick." Mm-hmm. This other one shocked me because I was like, I said to Brian, I'm "Like, what do you think kind of kills you?" This he's, I mean, he's rattling off yeah. shit. I asked you rattle. Fucking nicotine. I, I've never even heard uh, of We're going to have to do an episode yeah, on yeah, nicotine yeah. poisoning. Right. A, I don't know how you'd ingest so much nicotine it would kill you. Right. But apparently it'll kill you pretty you fucking quick. Patches on Imagine chewing the gum, patches, yeah. smoking a fucking right. camel. Drop death. Yeah. So the investigator, it's like it's either cyanide or nicotine. nicotine. He goes, open the bottle and smell it. He oh. goes, if it smells like bitter almonds, it's cyanide. Mm-hmm. Medical examiner opened it. He goes, bitter almonds. Another magazine... Um, Quoted it as smelling sweat socks. Ew. Well, I am sniffing sweat socks. I don't know, but it's mostly like either bitter almonds or sweat socks. And apparently I, bitter I almonds those smell, smell like sweat socks. <laughs> Ugh. It's like we went out tonight and one of our girlfriends had a dirty martini, which she insists on drinking and, and she, she doesn't, doesn't like them. them. No. And she said it tastes like sweat. <laughs> it's like, that's fucking gross. And she drank it for about three hours and it was maybe three sips. Yeah, she, but you had to see the sips and she was, it barely like, passed her lips. Like literally. She might as well just gone like this. And like, every sip, her, her face, she was like, Ugh. I'm like, get another drink. No, I want to like it. But you don't like it. You just don't like it. You're not going to change at almost 40 years old. All right. It cracks me up. And she ordered. I'm like, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it. So, Laura, could you explain to us what cyanide poisoning? Sure does? can. Now, you're going to have to excuse me because I had to do this voice to text and I have an accent. So it did not come out perfectly. <laughs> the pack. <laughs> well, it starts off cyanide Cameron, which is not. <laughs> so anyways, so you can get cyanide poisoning, poisoning or cyanide, really, from any chemical that contains a carbon nitrogen bond. So there's Ooh, a million interesting chemicals that have mm-hmm. a carbon nitrogen bond. And it can be found in like really weird places. It can be found in almonds, lima beans, soy, spinach. It is a common compound that is in your it life. It smells like bitter almonds. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but it's a common compound in a lot mm-hmm. of things in your life. You can also find it in natural compounds um, used in medication like Celexa and Tagamet. So there, cyanide is in... It's around. It's around. It's um, when you mix it without the shit that it becomes poisonous. Yes. What acts as poison in the body is the carbon nitrogen ion. Mm-hmm. So that's what's toxic. Um, cyanide is like a natural byproduct of metabolism in the human body. It's exhaled and um, with every breath you exhale cyanide. Mm-hmm. Deadly forms of cyanide include sodium cyanide, potassium cyanide, hydrogen cyanide, and cy- cyanogen chloride. Mm-hmm. Um, these can, cyanide can be a uh, solid, a liquid and a gas. And you are most likely to encounter cyanide during a building fire. Oh. That is when you are most likely to get cyanide poisoning. Um, symptoms of toxic cyanide exposure can appear within a few seconds to several minutes after exposure. You can experience overall weakness, nausea, confusion, headache, difficulty breathing, seizure, loss of consciousness, or cardiac arrest. The severity of the effects of the cyanide poisoning depends on the dose, the type of cyanide, and how long you are exposed. So, yeah, you might just feel nauseous mm. after, if you're exposed to a little bit of it. Or you could be excused, exposed to a huge amount and drop dead. Um, there are two different ways you can experience cyanide exposure. You can have acute cyanide poisoning, and um, which usually has immediate and life-threatening effects. Or you can have chronic cyanide poisoning which results from exposure to smaller amounts over time Um, acute cyanide poisoning is pretty rare the majority of cases are from unintentional exposure Um, if you do have an acute onset the they can come on the symptoms come on pretty sudden and pretty severe you can experience difficulty breathing seizure loss of consciousness and cardiac arrest if you suspect for a second that this is what's happening to you call Mm 911 Um, if you, you need, survive till they get there. Yeah. You need medical attention immediately. Um, chronic cyanide poisoning can occur if you're exposed to 20 to 40 pots per million <laughs> of hydrogen cyanide gas um, over a period of time. 
Symptoms are usually gradual and increase in severity over time as you're exposed more. Early symptoms are headache, drowsiness, nausea, vomiting, vertigo, and a bright red flush. Um, other symptoms may be dilated pupils, clammy skin, slow or shallow breaths. Fixed and dilated. Mm-hmm. Weak and rapid pulse and convulsions. If it remains undiagnosed and untreated, it can lead to slow irregular heart rate, reduced body temp, blue lips, face, and extremities, uh, coma, and death. So what are the the causes of cyanide poisoning? Like I said, if you're near a building fire is how you're mm-hmm. most likely going to get it. Um, it, it typically results from smoke inhalation or accidental poisoning when working with or around cyanide. You may be at risk for accidental exposure if you work in certain fields like metallurgy. So you're working with metals? (laughs) Metallurgy? Um, (laughs) Plastic manufacturing, fumigation, photography, um, and chemists may also be at risk because potassium and sodium cyanides are common reagents used in labs. You can also be at risk for cyanide poisoning if you use excessive amounts of nail polish remover. (laughs) (laughs) Or you ingest excessive amounts of certain plant-based foods like apricot kernels, cherry rocks, and peach pits. Why am I eating pits? Why are we eating pits? Don't eat pits. Um, How they diagnose cyanide poisoning. A, if you think you have cyanide poisoning, again, seek immediate medical attention. Immediately, because it doesn't, it'll kill you. Doctors will conduct blood tests to check your methemoglobin level. That's measured when there's a concern for smoke inhalation. So if they, if you were in a house fire, mm-hmm. you're having weird symptoms, they're going to draw this level to see if you have cyanide poisoning. Um, your blood carbon monoxide concentration is also measured when there's a concern for smoke inhalation. And then plasma lactate level um, can be drawn. It takes a while to come back, though, so they're not going to use that to diagnose you, but they will use it to confirm the diagnosis later on the first te- step to treating cyanide poisoning um is to identify the source of the exposure so they can know how to decontaminate yep. you yeah um if it's a fire uh rescue personnel will wear protective gear like face masks eye shields double gloves to enter the area and take you out of the location um if you've ingested cyanide you may be given activated charcoal to help absorb the toxin and safely clear it from your body Cyanide exposure can affect oxygen intake, so your doctor may administer 100% oxygen. In severe cases, your doctor could administer one of two antidotes. There's either a cyanide antidote kit or a cyano kit. Those are two different things. The cyanide, cyanide antidote kit has three medications that are given together. Um, there's <laughs> amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate, and sodium thiosulfate. The amyl nitrate is given by insulin. Inhalation for 15 to 30 seconds. The sodium nitrate is administered IV over three to five minutes, and the sodium thiosulfate is administered IV for about 30 minutes. They give all three of you, all three of those things to you at the same time. The cyano kit detoxifies cyanide by binding with it to produce vitamin B12, which is non toxic. So the stuff in the cyano kit binds to the cyanide. And creates vitamin B12, so now it's a safe so chemical. I know it's a chemical chemistry shit. Yeah. Um, so it creates this safe. You can just get rid of vitamin mm-hmm. B12. It's not going to hurt you. Um, this medication neutralizes cyanide at a very slow rate to allow an enzyme ca- called rhodanese to further detoxify cyanide in the liver. I wonder if they had these in 1982. I don't know. Um, if cyanide poisoning is left untreated, it can cause seizure, cardiac arrest, and death. To reduce your risk of cyanide exposure, you can take proper precautions against a home fire, install and maintain smoke detectors, change your goddamn batteries, <laughs> avoid using space heaters. Does it say change your goddamn yes. battery? Okay. And avoid smoking in bed. Mm, that's a big one. The house on the corner of my Nani Street burned down when we were kids. The lady was smoking in bed and we she just, died. I just had a woman come in smoking Yeah, with her O2 tanker. Yeah. Um, you should also child-proof your home, keep containers holding toxic chemicals secured in the cabinets, and kept locked. Um, also f- follow work safety regulations if you work with cyanide. Use removable, absorbable paper to line work surfaces. Keep quantities in containers. Um, 
in the work area as small as possible. Don't have a huge, you don't need a huge thing of cyanide at your table. <laughs> um, also leave all chemicals in the bring lab. Bring me the gallon of cyanide, yeah. please. Also leave all the chemicals in the lab of factory. No, don't bring home any potentially contaminated stuff. <laughs> I got a mason jar for a little cyanide for right. dinner. But if you work with it, like change your clothes there. Don't bring them home. Yeah. Leave everything at work. Um, and I got that information from healthline.com. I remember listening to something on, um, I think it's Richard Kukluxi. He, I'm gonna, it's a it's Polish name. He was a, the Iceman was his nickname and he was a killer. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. For the mob. Yeah. He was actually a serial killer that the mob hired. Happened. And it was yeah. like, perfect then. One of the things he used to do, I believe it was cyanide. He would spray it in your face as you walked by you. So these people would, they would think they died of heart attacks and he was killing people left and right with fucking cyanide Jesus. in the face. Because they say when you inhale it, it's even more toxic. Yeah. So this obviously checking to see if the cyanide is taking a couple of days. And there was another victim of this. And when you're listening to the podcast, the ep- it's a later episode. I can't remember if they found her, how long it was between when they found her body because she lived alone. So it took a day or two for them mm-hmm. to find her. But it's Paula Prince. She was born in 1946. She's a 35 year old flight attendant. And they're like, she was looking to get married. She was trying to settle down and meet a guy mm-hmm. and blah, 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 blah. She had um, been flying. She didn't feel great. She comes into her hair and she purchases Tylenol at the Walgreens and goes home. They're like, you could see where she had been taking her makeup off when oh, she God. took the Tylenol. That's how quickly she died. Yeah. And I think it was like two or three days later, somebody hadn't heard from her. They went mm-hmm. to find her. So she is another victim of the Tylenol murders. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. the investigators hand all the uh, pills over to the toxicology. Um, Dr. Kim gets the blood work back, and yes, it confirms that the Janus family had cyanide poisoning. Mm -hmm. The capsule, now the capsule toxicology comes back. Each capsule had enough cyanide to kill three people, (gasps) and they're taking two of them. Well, that's why they dropped. They dropped in a second. Uh, The Janus family is sent home, and the police don't know, like, they don't even know where to go to find a killer. Um, and I mentioned about Paula Prince. She dies two days later, found in her apartment. Um, within 48 hours of the discovery, all the Tylenols pulled off all of the shelves, Mm -hmm. like across the country. There's a massive recall of, um, Tylenol. Johnson and Johnson recalls 31 million bottles of Tylenol. They put out a reward. Now this is 1982, $100,000 for anybody who can give them the information to the capture of the killer. Mm -hmm. Um, they very quickly can discover that. It's not a contamination from the factory because it had to do with each bottle was made in a different factory. Mm-hmm. And other people are eating this Tylenol from other, and nobody else is getting sick. So they have pretty much narrowed it down. Somebody went into these stores locally, mm-hmm. contaminated the bottle, bought the bottles, opened up the bottle, put the pills in, sealed it up, put it back on the store shelves. Mm-hmm. So they don't even know where the fuck to look. Right. Okay. So we have suspect number one. Now I'm going to tell you to this day, nobody has gone to jail for these murders. Really? Yes. Oh, yes. And within, so the, what I said, September 29th, the murders start. And by October 1st, Johnson and Johnson has an extortion letter. Basically an extortion letter goes to Johnson and Johnson and Ronald Reagan. (laughs) And basically these letters, the extortion letter, Johnson Johnson's like, if you don't, it gave the cyanide's going to get worse. Like it gave very descriptive details of what had happened. This mm-hmm. is all going to come in later on in the story. Very descriptive details about the murders being cyanide, and there would be more cyanide and blah 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 if they didn't give the writer a million dollars. The one to Ronald Reagan was, "I'm going to kill more people if you don't lower taxes." Oh Jesus! So, God bless. Yeah. So, suspect number one is Roger Arnold. He's a 48-year-old dock worker at the Jewel Warehouse. You're talking Chicago, 1982. Everybody's, you know, working class schmojos, all right? Excuse me. They all go drinking at the local bar, blah, blah, blah. At the local bar that he goes to, the bartender remembers him saying he just bought a shit ton of cyanide. Okay? Now, when it comes to this particular suspect, obviously the FBI is involved. The state police are involved. The local police are involved. And because some of the murders happened in Chicago proper, the Chicago PD are involved. Because some happened in other cities, there's two detectives from Chicago PD. 
one of them, everything you would think of Chicago, this guy is, mm-hmm. okay? And what is going on at the same time of the Tylenol murders is multiple things going on, which is what made me listen to the Tylenol murders to begin. I was listening to a different podcast and they were talking about the Chicago Ripper. Yeah. Four guys killing all these women in Chicago. And mm-hmm. they said it went unnoticed because the Tylenol murders happened. Oh. They also have, I think it was the Murdoch 12 or something where there was 12 police officers. I don't know if they were all chief of police, state troopers or what, heroin ring going Ooh. in Chicago. So nobody trusts the Chicago police to begin with. So right. these two guys are like, we're fighting to get our jurisdiction. Nobody wants to listen to us because we're just two Chicago schmokes. But they are 100% convinced this is the killer. Okay. I'm not so sure. <laughs> um, so this guy buys a bunch of cyanide. So the bartender goes to the police and he tells them, this guy just bought it. He's bragging about all the cyanide. He's mm-hmm. kind of unbalanced, blah, 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 blah. So the local Chicago cops are convinced that this guy is the killer. Like they're like, we were going to get him to confess and blah, 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 blah. So they get a search warrant, October 11th, 1982. And they search his apartment. They find five guns, books on explosives and poisons, lab vials, beakers, test tubes, white powder. They never get enough of anything to charge him with the crimes. But the news media gets wind that this guy's a suspect fucking destroys his life. Okay. He is just, Loses his job. Everybody's hounded him. You're the Chicago. You're the murderer. You're the murderer. You're the murderer. So he blames this bartender, Marty Sinclair, Mm -hmm. for ruining his life. And he has now become fucking obsessed with Marty Sinclair. Marty Sinclair is like this big, like, 350, 6'2", big fucking Chicago Polish guy. Mm -hmm. So um, Roger Arnold is fixated on him. And eight months after the poisoning, he's going to find Marty Sinclair. He's got a bone to pick with him. So Marty has a best friend. His best friend, where is his friend? Is John. John is also 350, 6'2. Okay. Uh, Roger finds the two of them and he shoots John dead, thinking it's Marty. Oh, God. And the cops are like, what the fuck did you just do? That's not even Marty Sinclair. <laughs> he immediately goes to the police, turns himself in. They, he was just beside himself. He goes to prison for the murder of this guy. Mm-hmm. And in 2008, He's released. Now, one of the paperwork said that he died of natural causes. But when you listen to the podcast, you're led to believe he committed suicide. Mm-hmm. He had been divorced and like he he had been working after he got out of prison. But his life was fucking ruined yeah. because of the suspicion that he was um, the murderer. Yeah. Suspect number two. This guy's a real piece of fucking shit. Okay. And most of the podcast is focused on this man. Who is currently living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. And he's probably late 70s, early 80s at this point. So the Chicago Tribune breaks the story on October 8th, 1982, that they get this ransom note demanding a million dollars sent to Johnson & Johnson. It's postmarked October 1st, 1982, two days after the murders um, Mm -hmm. have been released. And... They lift a fingerprint from the letter, and it's linked to this James Lewis. Okay. All right. Now, at the time, they cannot read the postmark date on the letter. All right. It didn't. They weren't able to read the postmark date on that letter till like 2015, because of it was so. Decom- mm-hmm. Whatever the technology we have today, they didn't have 1982, and they weren't able to catch the date that because the date becomes crucial, and why people think he is the killer. Okay. All right. So, James Lewis. I could go on three episodes about this piece of shit, all right? He's a con artist. Mm -hmm. He is a credit card fraud. Mm -hmm. He would set up fake mailboxes and take and and have you apply for a credit card and then take it. He is linked to the murder of a 73-year-old man in... I forgot what state it is. This poor guy, nice old man, never married, had money, blah, 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 blah. He was, this was his friend Mm -hmm. and his tax man. Okay. He goes missing for like a week. Mm -hmm. And the only one that keeps coming up is this James Sinclair or Mm -hmm. James uh, Lewis. He went by James Rich. He has a million fucking aliases, him and his wife. And finally, they're like, this, this, you know, they were finding checks written by the tax man trying Mm -hmm. to get money. They're like, he would never have written this kind of money. They eventually find this man dismembered in his attic, (gasps) but they have no way 
At, if it was today, this guy would have been in jail for the murder. They couldn't get him on this murder. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they lift the fingerprint, but they can get him for this extortion letter. And like I said, you've got to really read the cat and mouse game between him and the police for all these years. But he goes to jail for the extortion letter. Okay. And he denies he had anything to do with these murders. Mm-hmm. Not me, not me, not me, not me, not me. So now they've, the FBI, 40 years later, is still trying to get him for these fucking oh murders, God. okay? The letter for the extortion that gives vivid details of the poisonings is postmarked October 1st. Mm-hmm. He claims it took him three days to write this letter because he had to research all the information that the news media had put out. Mm-hmm. The murders were September 29th. Mm-hmm. There is no way. He had to be writing the letter on September 29th. Right. And the only person who would have known the information that was coming out because the news media hadn't reported anything is the killer. Mm-hmm. They also took it like, so what they were doing is when he was in prison, the FBI would go be like, they kind of did this with Ted Bundy. If you were the killer, what would you have done? Right. And he's like, well, I would have had this pill making machine and I would have done A, B and C, D to make the pills. And that's exactly like what they figured had to happen. Mm-hmm. And he, they, when he got out, they were still playing this game with him. He took them to the stores that the Tylenol was bought from, which now this is 35 years later. Mm-hmm. He knew exactly where the Tylenol was in 1982. Yeah. They're like, how did you know? How would you have known that right. in these particular stores? So the letter, though, is really where like the only person who could have written that letter was the killer. Yeah. And he is connected to writing that letter. Right. But he's never convicted of these murders and he's still living in Cambridge. Yeah. So today we still have to go through what, you know, a ton of shit just to get the fucking Tylenol bottle open. Yeah. Because he decided to put, oh, so the motive, this is what I'm So they're like, what would be the motive? Now this Roger Arnold had no fucking motive to go after Johnson mm-hmm. and Johnson. James Lewis had a five-year-old daughter who had, I believe, Downs. Mm-hmm. She had had cardiac surgery when she was five. She had to go back in for cardiac surgery. She dies. I don't know if she died on the table or shortly after. Mm-hmm. And they found out the reason she died is because the prolines that they used to sew her arteries gave oh. and she bled out. The maker of the proline was Johnson and Johnson. So they're like, he had a motive, mm-hmm. etc. Um, and, you know, he was taunting the police and all, all the, he was just an, he's a horrible human being. Yeah. And I can't believe he's fucking yeah. living in Cambridge. Yeah, that's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So um, if you get the chance, it's called the uh, Chicago Tylenol. Oh, it's called the Tylenol mm-hmm. Martyrs, written by the Chicago Tribune. It is an excellent, 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 excellent podcast. And on that note, one more podcast, The DC Sniper. Yeah, everybody keeps telling me. It is fucking awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. How they found to- them, how they took them down. That's another one. I listened to, I think, uh, the quick episodes. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, burping again. And... um. It, it, the, the maybe half an hour. I listened to like eight in one day. I was just cleaning and doing shit, yeah. and I'm walking around plant, and I'm like, oh my God, the takedown. Oh, I gotta listen to what happened, the takedown. What a story. I remember that happening too, yeah. but I don't remember any of the details. I was at Market Basket, and I'm shopping, and they're interviewing the husband of one of the victims. And he's like a little Hispanic guy. He's saying how like he didn't speak any English. I'm assu- I didn't see the victims. I'm assuming his wife is white just by what he was talking about. And he's like, she didn't speak Spanish. I didn't speak English. And I had my older brother ask her out on a date. I'm in market basket fighting back tears while this guy <laughs> is talking about how much he loved his wife. It Aww. broke my heart listening to him talk about yeah. like when you just listen. And then, you know, one woman was a nurse and she's like, I thought the woman was electrocuted. She was just on the ground. And when right. she starts talking about I was trying to do CPR and she's like, and the police come up and they're like, you need to go in that building. And she's like, no, we need to do two man CPR. He's like, no, you need to go in that building. The police will do the CPR with me. She's like, no, like a typical, no, no. He's like, get in the fucking building. (laughs) She was like calling her husband. You're not going to believe this. He's like, there's a sniper out there. What's wrong with you? So great podcast, DC sniper. If you get a chance to listen to it. I think those two guys did that together. Because why would that guy have cyanide and all those test tubes? They didn't know each other. But what did he need that for? I think people did weird shit. With cyanide? What are you making in test tubes with cyanide? They poisoned rats with it. 
people do weird shit. Test tubes. You just yeah, don't need test tubes. That you just sprinkle. These that shit. guys didn't know each other. Mm. They didn't know each other. And I'm did. telling you, when you really listen to this, James Lewis, he is such a snake piece of shit. Yeah. Like you name it, he. I mean, even in prison, he was running scams. Now, I'm not saying he didn't do it. Yeah. But I'm just saying, why does that guy have test tubes and all I this science I think stuff? He's just a weirdo. And cyanide. Poor but where's this shit? Is that why we have the seals? Yes. Yeah. The cotton, the well, the cotton's to keep it from, but they had the seals and the caps and the, the wrapping around the box. Like, I mean, think of Tylenol was tainted for a long time because of that. Like, I remember my mother getting rid of Tylenol and being like, I ain't taking Tylenol no more because they were terrified. You know, it's the same when they were putting fucking razor blades in the apples and like every safety mechanism we have today is because somebody did some stupid shit back in the 70s and 80s that ruined it, you know, mm. took all your naive. Um, you know, cause nine eleven, all these things. We had such a naive way of life, and then somebody does something like this, and yeah. you're like, "Don't fucking take the Tylenol. Don't touch the apples. Don't eat the pixie sticks." Somebody poisons a kid with pixie sticks at Halloween, and nobody's eating fucking pixie sticks for ten years. You know, I ate pixie sticks. I mean, remember, a kid? Um, what was that cereal? Was it Life? Mikey, he like, hey Mikey, he likes yeah. it. And everybody was like, he ate pop rocks with Coke and died. And everyone's like, don't eat the Pop Rocks. You're going to die. Do you remember that? No. I remember yeah. people doing that. Do you remember that, that Mike? I remember that commercial very well. Yeah. I remember the commercial. <laughs> Supposedly the actor, they had said mix. Do you remember what Pop, Pop Rocks were? Yeah. They were like, a kid. yeah. And he mixed it with Coke up. and it blew up his esophagus. Like, that was the rumor spreading around. Oh, I was like, don't eat the fucking Pop Rocks. You're going to die. I'm like, I love Pop Rocks. Great. One's the best. <laughs> so, yeah. It's just they, a lot of these people. People took innocence away. Yeah. You know, you you no longer, we can just open in a bottle of the Tylenol anymore. Now it takes an act of God. Um, So that's Tylenol murders and Laura's surgery wrapped mm-hmm. up in one summer episode mm-hmm. for you, even though this happened in the fall. Um, <laughs> And we've got a fun episode next week. And we'll yeah. still take some ideas because this is a fly by night operation these days because we don't know what the fuck we're writing about anymore. <laughs> um, So have a wonderful summer. Hopefully it'll warm up because here it is June 4th and it's 52 degrees. It's terrible. Um, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And thank you for everybody who took care of me. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Like, subscribe, rate, and review the Scissors and Scrubs podcast on whatever podcast app you listen to us on. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Scissors and Scrubs. And email us any of your stories or thoughts to scissorsandscrubs at gmail.com. <laughs>